voices, the 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 voices. Uh, let's see. The inspiration, moving on to part three. Um, I've been listening to, to your album on, on Spotify for uh, the last couple of days driving around. And um, I, I haven't really focused too much on the lyrics. Um, I do try to like in my head sing, sing along a little bit to, to understand mm -hmm. it, but I haven't focused on what you're saying too much. Um, I did hear in the one song in the beginning, I forgot which one it was, um, you had mentioned Seraphim, if I heard it correctly. You did not. <laughs> I don't actually use that word anywhere uh, on that album. Though, yeah. stay tuned. Maybe more come in the future. We'll see. Oh, okay. Well, that leads to the next question then. With your religious background, is that does that inspire you in any way? Uh, sure. It's um, actually pretty hard to get away from that. So, defiled creation... Uh, thematically, I'm asking the question I'm asking underlying everything else is always how much of my reality am I parsing through my personal philosophy and how much of that determines my religious or political views and vice versa. So it's really hard for humans to be totally objective, even those of us who lean more towards being logical versus being emotional. And I guess you could think of the album as being um, like a circle. So constantly one is influencing the next which is influencing the next so each piece that i'm singing about here is influenced by that personal philosophy which is also influenced by my religion which is also influenced by my politics which are in turn influenced by my personal philosophy which have been influenced by the other two so everything is self-reinforcing it's actually very difficult to bring yourself out of that headspace i think probably one of the greatest challenges of my life was really reevaluating my politics which happened, I guess, in my late 20s. So uh, when the housing crisis hit, it pretty much destroyed my family's business. And that had a really huge impact on, on pretty much everything that I believed or viewed up until that time. Um, I'd been a fairly staunch, uh, fairly right-wing Republican. And uh, at that point, I, I just looked at the way that the party was functioning. I said, you know what, both of these parties absolutely suck. I do not agree with the ideals or the viewpoints of either one of these groups. Um, when I get into it, neither one is actually a party of small government and efficient government and small government spending. And to me, that's what I'd always been raised with. You know, that was the reason why my family had kind of uh, embraced this whole republicanism. You know, my grandfather was a small business owner. That was very much his viewpoint. And uh, so that in turn got passed to my father, who is, a, is himself a small business owner. And uh, so it's hard to grow up in that environment and not share some of those views. And same thing with religion. It's hard to grow up in that environment and not share some of those views. Now, at a certain point, you do have to think for yourself. At a certain point, you have to evaluate everything. Mm -hmm. Even the name of the band comes from that. Quis Deo, it's who is God. If you're directly transliterating it from Latin, that's the meaning. And that thought had come to me because I was really having, a, I guess I'll call it a spiritual crisis, where I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is what I've been taught for my whole life, but what is it that I actually believe? I mean, I think that there's a God or a higher power, if you want to view it that way. Uh, and how was it that I've arrived at that conclusion? And why is it I think that way? And my thought process was kind of, you know, um, the universe can't exist separately from the laws which govern it. Uh, and since nothing in the universe exists spontaneously, the universe itself can't exist spontaneously. So I was starting with that thought process and I'm going, so the only way that something that the universe could exist is if something exists outside the universe, outside of its laws and therefore creates it unless you get into some of like um, Hawking's later theories, which is this uh, perpetually expanding and contract, contracting universe. But yep. either way, a um, couple of different ways to approach it. And I thought, well, okay, I think that probably there's something outside of it, you know, just based upon, again, I'm sure that I'm influenced by my background, um, partly based upon just my own experiences. I, you know, I think that there's something else out there, but if there is this something else, what is it? Who is it? Who is God? So that was the, the foundation of the band, really. It's this skeptical asking of, okay, so if there is a God, which one? Um, and, and 
th are there elements of how that um, how that higher power, whatever someone chooses to call it, affects your life uh, or on a daily basis or or life in general? Uh, throughout the album, um, I, probably I deal more with, I guess I'll call it the output, than I'm dealing with God in particular, okay? Mm -hmm. So even using God as a concept. And what I mean by that is if you listen to The Awakening and if you delve into the lyrics in The Awakening, on the one hand, you've got like this call to be this upright person, okay? And that, that is what I view as being sort of the call of that higher power upon your life. Mm -hmm. um, somebody who is moral and somebody who is upright and somebody who is not overtly harmful to the people around him right. or her. And then on the other hand, you have what man has made it, which is um, just this tyrannical, oppressive system whereby the masses are oftentimes violently suppressed or controlled by persons in power. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly not trying to get too Marxist with you on that <laughs> thought process. I'm not, you know, not opiate of the masses per se, but I, th I think that Nietzsche was really onto something when he started talking about the necessity for controlling man once God has truly died in a society. Mm -hmm. And I, I, there's a lot that feeds into that. So to kind of bring it back, I'm talking about the impact of religion, but I'm not necessarily talking about God per se. Right. Mm -hmm. I do have right. references to God into that higher power, but I try and make sure that that is very distinct mm -hmm. from when I'm speaking specifically about the failures of the church, uh, the moral failures of our politicians and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, since we've been talking about um, the thought processes behind um, your, your, your lyrics and the concepts of your songs, um, what is your process or your inspiration for actually writing lyrics and what is your musical writing process do they do the music and lyrics come together or are you do you, i know for me um i have piles of books of lyrics and then i noodle around and come up with something that i think is kind of cool and then i go run with it and i write this piece of music and then I'll go through, if I'm using my lyrics, I'll go through the sets of lyrics that I have to see if something fits the music that I, that I put together. Um, mm -hmm. So, and I know a lot of people don't, don't do it like that. And, and I'm a very, just like in playing guitar, uh, guitar is a linear instrument. It's not like uh, woodwinds or brass where the scale isn't the same pattern uh, like it is on the guitar. So the guitar, every different scale has the exact same fingering. So like uh, a, every, every major scale or sure. minor scale has the exact same th fingering. Um, and it's just a matter of the, the note that you're starting on or the note that you're em emphasizing. So um, I kind of write like that where I have no idea what the overall end thing is going to be at the beginning whereas mm -hmm. I, I was talking the other day with adrian about this how mozart um i've heard that he was quoted as once saying that uh he never oh, wrote God. a piece of music in his life he only transcribed what he heard in his head and when you look at if, if you've ever seen any of his actual manuscripts for his symphonies out of the entire symphony, there might only be three or four measures that are crossed out and redone. It's like he wrote it exactly how it, it was without revision almost, um, which is I'm layering. So I'll come up with a little, with a riff. And then, you know, maybe two years later, I come up with another riff and I'm like, wait, that would kind of go with this one. And I'll mm. put those two, two together. Um, but then like after coming up with a riff, I'll then look at the notes and I'll figure out what the, the scale is um, that it's in. And then I will start harmonizing. 
then I'll go to the, to the keyboards or the piano to add something from there and then maybe add another guitar part. And so it's almost like in my writing process, it's a, uh, um, the, the song itself develops a life of its own. And then it tells me when it's done. Um, so how, how does that all, how does it work for you? So I wouldn't say it's all that different from your process. I, just to dispel any myths or illusions, um, I'm no Mozart, so I'm not plucking songs from midair most of the time. <laughs> uh, and for me, usually the writing process begins with a guitar riff or a series of guitar riffs. Uh, sometimes I'll be noodling around on the guitar and I'll find something that I like, and usually it's something fast and aggressive. And sometimes, though, the idea will arrive fully formed in my head, so I'll be sitting there and I'll be actually trying to bring out something on the guitar neck that I'm hearing in my head that it, when it does arrive like that, it is multi-part. So I'm hearing a bass line, I am hearing a second guitar part and I'm thinking, okay, this is kind of where I want to go with this. But that is certainly the exception, not the rule. Um, almost always my songs start with the music rather than the lyrics. So from there, the song builds. Since my tendency is to write concept albums, once I have a riff or a couple of riffs framed out, I look at where I can plug that riff in, either in another unfinished song or as a new track, kind of similarly to your own process. Um, but I'm, I'm already writing around a theme. I already have something in mind. And so what usually I'm writing is something that fits within that context. Right. So as far as sources of creativity, I'm a pretty avid reader and I read everything from leadership books to fantasy and science fiction. That said, even when I deal with more fantastic concepts, I tend to use them to explore the real world. On mm -hmm. the sixth day, God creates man and man spends the next few eons returning the favor. That actually uh, answers the uh, next couple questions that I had. Um, mm -hmm. As far as like with your writing, do you, where do you start? Like, do you write the music first or do you write the lyrics first? Like what does one inspire the other? Um, if, if you have like an idea for uh, the, the lyrics, you know, would that inspire or uh, help with the creation of the, the guitar parts? Yeah, so um, I guess I've, I've kind of touched on that a little bit. Usually it does start with the music as opposed to the rest, but because I am writing for a concept, that concept is heavily influencing even the way that I'm playing guitar. So I'm currently, I've started the next album. I'm actually, about seven songs deep into the next album. So it's coming along pretty nicely now that I know how to do all of this stuff and learn how to do all the recording process in my home. Um, because of the topic, I tend to write using a lot of harmonic minor type scales in it, yep. more of that, that in the Eastern theme. So I already know a little bit of what the guitar parts are gonna sound like. I'm not married to those ideas, but that mm -hmm. is definitely present in my writing. And as a result, the vocals are going to be influenced by that. And as I've, as I've developed vocally, so when I first started, I did a lot more singing in my, the lower portion of my range. That was a lot more common for me to do. And songs like uh, The Masquerade still show maybe a little bit more of that, or uh, songs like Before the Tyrant Throne still show a little bit more of that type of singing. But as I've gotten older, my range has actually improved. My control over it has slightly improved. It, more times than not, it's still a little bit random. It's still me trying to fumble around and figure out what I'm doing. I'm a guitarist first and a vocalist second. But that has in turn allowed me to explore different sonic landscapes than I ever would have considered a decade ago. So the, the music from before um, that you had, did you have keyboard on them as well? Hadn't been planned. The only song that we'd originally done with keyboards in it was Destroyed Invincible. And you may recall that we did a demo version of that back in uh, 2012. And uh, JD, who's one of my very close friends had come in and because he actually helped me co-write that song back in the beginning, that song actually came from a dream. That was one that emerged uh, fully formed. I. You know, I woke up, I had these riffs in my head. I go and I start frantically tabbing this stuff out. And I said, you know, hey, you know, you hear music kind of the same way I do. You want to put your spin on this, send it over to him. And he started adding in these elements. I'm going, 
this is fantastic. This is great stuff. So we, a few minutes, we knocked out the majority of that song. We've got this cool interplay of melodies between the two parts. And uh, yeah, that was, it came from a dream. He hadn't featured prominently until, well, um, once Brian left and Brian kind of left midway through the recording process. A lot of the reason why our recording was so badly delayed was we lost first our bass player and our second guitarist a couple of months later. Um, midway through this recording process. And at that point, I didn't have the chops. I couldn't just go in and record all of their parts. I didn't know all of their parts. Right. So we just kind of bagged it. And JD came on board and he and I started doing more jamming. And um, as we did, I said, hey, some of these old songs, you want to go back? Do you want to take a crack at it see what you can come up with? And so the summons was a good example of that. Summons are still two distinct guitars, at least, um, plus its own separate keyboard line. And Destroyed Invincible, because that was written for keyboards already, that was an easy transition. Uh, the Awakening was originally written for two guitars. That was the first one where I said, okay, I'm just gonna get rid of the second guitar part. You can go ahead, you can play the, uh, the second guitar part on the keyboards, but you know, put your own spin on things. And, and he did. Uh, so yeah, keyboards was definitely not the way that I had originally thought it through but I love a lot of what he came up with. And if we could have featured him more, I would have loved to have done that. Now you said that the, the song came from a dream. Yes. And by song, you mean the music part? Yes. See that? Some of my writings have actually been a dream. I have one story that, um, actually I have several stories where I woke up and was like, wow, like, what was that? And then I spend the next you know, 30, 40 minutes trying to remember everything and figure out like, why was this in my head to begin with? And what does it mean? And let's get it on paper. And, um, you know, so I was like, but those, those are words. Those are, are uh, words that I can write. But you're talking about the music. How do you, how do you dream music? How, that's kind of interesting. You don't have sound in your dreams? I have my voice. That's, so so that's, when you dream, it's just a blackness that just has this this baritone voice in it. Adrian. I like that. <laughs> Luckily, I haven't had a dream like that. That would freak me out. <laughs> but um, no, I, I see shapes and um, figures, and then the, the the words. I hear the words, you know, but. I don't know, maybe I just don't under, um, it's hard for me to, I think it's really cool, but I just can't understand it as far as like, I, I'm hearing music, I'm dreaming music and then I wake up and I can write down these music notes and all that I, I heard in a dream. Well, so so yeah, I, I think maybe maybe here here's the equivalent. Um, so, I mean, dreams are really hard. There are all the kinds of theories out there for dreams. Um, but the only thing actually proven is that we dream and that dreams appear to us as we can't differentiate a dream from reality until we wake up and realize it was a dream. Um, <clears throat> so people dream in different ways and, and there's a high probability that it's personal experiences or thoughts, feelings, and things like that, that may translate into dreams so for like josh and myself um being musicians and songwriters it might not be that far of a stretch to say that it's easier for us to dream and hear music or dream that we were writing something and then wake up and go oh man i know i was writing something in my dream and that was so good i gotta do something about it kind of thing. Whereas maybe for you, it's you wake up and go, man, I had this great idea. I have to write it down uh, because your creativeness is more uh, grounded in writing. Um, so maybe that's kind of the equivalent there. Yeah, I, I would I definitely, understand. I would definitely agree with what Mike is saying there. Uh, and tying this into personal experience, because I started playing music so much later in life, I still remember the way that I perceived music before I started playing an instrument versus the way that I perceived music after I started playing an instrument. And before, because 
I sang at least a little bit for my own entertainment, what I tended to focus on and what most people in my experience tend to focus on is the vocal part of the music. They like the way that the voice sounds and maybe they're motivated also by the beat because everybody feels that, but they're not necessarily dissecting the song. And uh, even, well, even a lot of my friends, when they'll comment, the reason that they're not into things like melodic death metal is because they can't get past the vocals. They don't hear the guitar, they just hear the vocals and that's what impacts them. Whereas as I got deeper and deeper into music, I'm listening to this and I'm going, oh, those guitars are incredibly melodic. I just, oh, I love the yes. melody line there. And the fact that the vocals are so aggressive in no way detracts from this musical experience for me. Mm -hmm. So I think that it's kind of the same way with dreams. Uh, probably chances are good. You do dream in music at least a little bit. Maybe you hear melodies very slightly, but as Mike was pointing out, because he tends to be a songwriter because I tend to be a songwriter we're maybe a little bit more in tune with that portion of our dreams. Whereas you're in tune with maybe more of the other creative elements that are coming out in the form of writing concepts, thoughts, ideas. I, I think it's very, very interesting. Um, the creative process that people have, no matter what they're creating, whether it's, it's a painting, um, a, a car, a building, a, a book, or uh, just a, a piece of music, you know, the creative process of it is, Really wait, 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 just a piece of music? <laughs> Listen to this guy. <laughs> Where does he live? Let's go key his car. I'm going to write musical notation on the side of that. It's going to be a work of art. You, you'll, you'll notice that I, that I emphasize writing a book first, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, I just, see, now I'm going to lose my train of thought. Um, Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's the old age. Pretty soon I'm going to be 54. Mm. Um, <laughs> but just the, the the way that uh people can just create stuff you know i think that is yeah. super cool um i i can't draw i can draw stick figures you know uh barely uh, but i started doing stuff on the computer you know just you know with a, a really simple basic uh, art program just making stuff and that kind of like how I got into writing because I couldn't come up with any ideas as far as what to make, um, mm -hmm. uh, as far as the, the pictures go in the art, the art. But um, a lot of it was like uh, business cards and stuff like that that I made. And then it was just stupid stuff that I was making for myself, um, just as a hobby when I was sitting there drinking. But then mm -hmm. I started writing stuff down and just going from, from there and creating. And I've gotten back to a little bit with the um, doing art stuff as far as like creating, uh, I'm not sure I can call them films, you know, but the short films that I'm creating, you know, based on my writings and everything. And uh, which one of them actually was a dream where uh, me flying an airplane on the side of a highway with, um, I don't know if it was JR or another dog, but there was a dog picking up something and just, you know, trying to figure out like what the hell does that mean and why am I thinking this? You know? Wait, wait, wait. Were were was the dog in the plane flying with you, or was did you see the dog picking up something on the sidewalk? It was a paper plane. It was oh. me throwing a paper plane sitting ah. on the side of a highway or a road. Um, a dog picking something up, which okay. I don't know if it was the plane or not. <laughs> but a car coming towards me with the guy holding the paper plane. So right, okay, I got gotcha. you. Uh, I'm sorry, I was confused when I when I heard um, I was flying an airplane. I thought you were literally flying an airplane, <laughs> you know, not that you were making paper airplanes and launching them. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's me making a paper airplane, <laughs> which in my which dream would be flying an airplane. <laughs> I'm gonna fly an airplane. Yeah. Not sure yeah. why, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh so um i i'd actually like to go back a little bit from what josh was uh just saying about um pre-musician the view of music pre-musician to post-musician because i i am 100 percent exactly there with you so i was late as well i started playing guitar at 17 okay um and I, the only reason that I picked it up was ever since I was a little kid, I loved to sing. Mm -hmm. And that, and 
when I was in junior high, I mean, I didn't have a lot of fun. I was kind of a loner. And so when I had personal issues to work out, um, a lot of times I did that through writing poetry. Um, and then at some point I, I changed that into putting it into lyrics. Um, and, you know, there were these just great musicians back at that time in the late seventies and the early eighties. Um, and I thought, you know, that's really what I want to do. And I had started writing these lyrics because I wanted to sing. And so I picked up guitar and the only thing I didn't want to be a guitar player. I wanted to learn enough about music to write music for my lyrics so I could sing. Turned out when I got into college and got a four track recorder and I first recorded myself singing, it was like, well, I think we should try to learn guitar better. <laughs> <laughs> but I appreciate uh, your honesty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, and, and, you know, I sang for my, my first band, Mind Over Matter, but I never wanted to. My mm. vision had always been having a dual guitar band with keyboards and having a front man that was the crazy front man who could just rile up the crowd and, and get them going. And just, they focused on one thing and it was those vocals. And then in the instrumental parts, they were just getting everybody riled up. Um, and we couldn't find a singer. And I was like, well, if we're gonna, if we're gonna start playing out, I'm gonna have to do this. And right. unfortunately, you know, I mean, your stuff is is pretty complex and and the speed with which you play and sometimes i i used to watch you and think how in the hell do you sing over what you're playing you know and in mine it was like i had these changing time signatures um where the time signature would change every measure five eight seven eight five eight seven eight and i'm playing and having to sing over that i had one uh, part that was part that was in uh, thirteen eight that I had to sing over while I was playing it, and and then there were then there were parts where I just gave up. I gave my guitar part to the other guitar player, and and I just I couldn't play um, in order to sing at that part because I couldn't play and and sing it at the same time. Um, although now you know, well, I've been a longtime fan of uh, Pain of Salvation and watching Daniel Gildenlow play some of the ridiculously complex odd riffs that he plays and sometimes seem like he's singing in a different uh, time signature than he's playing guitar. I mean, how anyone has the ability to do that, I have no idea. With the, um, we're kind of touching on uh, part four as well, the process with uh, inspiration here. But um, you play guitar, obviously, Josh. Um, you write the lyrics and you've played uh, the bass also on your, your, your recent album. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> I'll, edit that part out. I'll, I'll edit that part out. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> the, the drums, your, your brother plays the drums. What's right? Now, do you have any influence or any say over what he writes on drums or you just say, hey, do this, and he does it? So I really leave Dave pretty much alone. But the nice thing about the fact that we're brothers is that on some level we hear music similarly, which means that it's very rare that I hear something that Dave settles on and I think to myself, I really don't like the way that that sounds. There have been a couple of times where I, eventually I'll say, okay, you know, this is... I think maybe you should focus on something like this, but first we have to understand, I don't speak drummer. So what am I going to say to him? Like, could you play more like thub, 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 and less of like the smack, <laughs> smack, smack, smack. And that really is the way that it sounds to him when I'm trying to talk with him about drama stuff. And probably at some point, I'm going to have to learn how to play a little bit better just so I can tell him, Hey, use the snare, use the kick, use the hi-hat. You know, this is really what I've got in mind for this section. But most of the time I don't have to do that. I just leave him to his own devices and we'll noodle on stuff for a while before we settle on anything. 
and part of what I enjoy about writing with Dave is he rarely disappoints me in what he comes up with. You know, um, the, I don't know what I want to call it, the verse section for the awakening. It's kind of a weird section. It's got like a, a random 516 spar thrown in the middle of it. So talking about strange time signatures, I actually only found out it was 516 when I finally sat down and started lining this with a grid. And I was um, going to say, when, you, oh, when was, you recorded it, <laughs> that happened that was, to me so many times. I'm yep. like, I thought this was straight time. Yeah. And, and it turned out to be five, four instead of four, four. And I'm like, well, that's why I can tap my foot to it, but it doesn't fit in a regular time signature. <laughs> exactly. And, and that was just something that he and I, you know, when I first wrote it, I actually wrote it in 6-4. And I knew exactly what the time signature was, but as we played it, it evolved. And it's yeah. both a good and a bad thing. You know, you get that creative influence from somebody else and you want that. And because for such a long time, Dave has been the only other consistent member of Quiz Deo, I, had, I need the creative influence coming from somewhere else. Otherwise, it's entirely dependent upon me. And I just, I don't have the background in percussion. You know, drums, yeah. they're cool and great for the people who want to play them, but I've never been a drummer. And, and really bad for their parents when the kids are practicing. That's right. Yeah, the whole neighborhood knew when my brothers were practicing. And um, because there's 10 of us, I didn't actually just have one drummer brother, I had two drummer brothers. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, at least theoretically, we have a volume knob on our amplifiers that, of course, never goes below 10, but uh, well, but it's there. But in theory, right. In, in, that's it right. could. <laughs> Mike had touched on this a little bit um, earlier with uh, the, the way that you play, you know, with the speed of it. And I remember, I think this was at the Rusty Nail over in Ardmore. Uh, watching you guys play and I was kind of focused on Dave uh, the, the stage isn't that big you know um, but like fo focusing on Dave and how he's playing and you play very fast with with guitar um, and Dave is playing just as fast or if not faster as far as what I can see um, and it's just how the hell do you do it like how do you how are you able to stay within that um that that rhythm i guess or uh keep, keep up that pace throughout the whole not just one song but all the songs that you play i don't know that there's really an easy answer to that maybe it's something in the way that i'm wired um, i've always loved very fast riffs for me that's why megadeth inevitably won out the battle of the big four you know they just they happen to stay the fastest and yet still retain some element of melody which i think is so vital in the songwriting process so my early inspiration i started off with metallica from metallica i got into megadeth and from megadeth into other various very technical projects um, but megadeth was really the one that stuck in that when i look back on the songwriting just they have so many unbelievably good blazing fast guitar riffs. And that was really my, I think my early influence. So as I'm sitting there and I'm playing Holy Wars, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, everything that he's doing, this is a rhythm guitar solo. And I love that approach to things. And so I'm going to do that. And I'll put it this way. Pretty much anything that I write, I can sing something over it. It's not always true if somebody else has written it. So that's why I say that there's something in the creative process that maybe hardwires this stuff into my brain, into your brain, Mike. I don't know if your experience is similar, but I find that, yeah, if I'm trying to cover somebody else's material, although I haven't hit too many barriers in that regard, there are occasionally things that I can't play and sing at the same time, certainly not easily. Whereas with my own material, even as technical and complex and challenging as it can be, it's really a lot more simple for me to say, okay, I'm going to put vocals over top of this and then to be able to do that. Uh, now I will say this, you can be a vocalist and you can be a guitarist, but you will never be as good at either one of those things if you're doing both together. I am absolutely always sacrificing something. My vocal technique is never as good when I'm playing guitar at, the, at my most technical level. And as a guitarist, I am always sloppier and less precise when I'm singing at the same time. I do my best to mitigate that. The only way to really deal with that is to just basically practice endlessly. If I want to be good at my music, 
it's like minimum two hours per day. And a lot of that against a click track or metronome or something, some equivalent to that. Or just sitting there and I'm playing it over and over again. And I'm just making sure my technique is perfect. Okay. Now I've got that. Let me start introducing vocals. Right. Get, get to a point where um, it's the pattern is so ingrained automated that you don't have to think about it <clears throat> exactly um, yeah and and with the singing and playing too one of the things that blew me away is like i could listen to like a recording um or and and practice singing my songs over that recording and you know diaphragm and belt it out and use a lot of vibrato and all this kind of stuff to embellish the the vocals and then all of a sudden when I was playing it yeah. was like I just sprinted the length of the football field and I couldn't breathe I mean, sure. it was unbelievable how physically how much it takes out of you yep. to both play and sing at the same time which is to me part of the appeal the yeah. only time I ever feel like I'm 100% engaged with the entirety of life is when I'm playing and singing at the same time, is specifically my material. And it is because it utterly engrosses me. It is fully demanding of all of my senses to be able to play and sing that and do it well, especially if I'm performing in front of an audience, because then you also have the necessity of the stage presence and the projection of your essence to the crowd. So it's the head banging and uh, everything that goes into that. And whew, I'll tell you what, I identify very strongly with your statement about feeling like you just ran a hundred yard dash or whatever, because by the time I am done at show, I am done. I'm like I'm going right. home, I'm going to eat like 5,000 calories and then I'm going to sleep for about a week. <laughs> well, I'm glad you could get to sleep after shows. Usually my adrenaline was just through the roof and it would take hours before I was, I would just lay in bed going, man, I know I need to get to sleep my alarm's going off in two hours to get up for work since all original music live venues only have you play on weekdays. Right. <laughs> you know, and I'm like going, ah, and they finally fall asleep and then the alarm goes off. That's right. And you know what? You still want to go do it again because it's all worth it. Oh, sure. Usually For me, the I most powerful right drug that I've ever encountered has been that adrenaline of playing live shows, and that's part of what gets you. I don't think that I would have been willing to put up with all of the, the crap that you deal with just being a musician were it not for those moments of adrenaline. Yeah. Uh, for that matter, you know, good things come out of it. I met my wife at a show, so. Was that one of your shows or a yeah. different show? It was actually the last show that Cristeo played live. We played in uh, April of uh, 2016, and um, she came out to was one of the audience participants. She was immediately noticeable because she wore white to a metal show. <laughs> Newbie. <laughs> Did she enjoy the, the music? Did she enjoy the show? Hated it. That's why, of course, she latched on to me immediately. But, yeah, but she the, really liked it. She's she very was. supportive of my music. And that's, uh, that has been tremendously helpful. It's not many people who understand or who are going to understand what I say. Okay. I've got to go lock myself in my studio for the next couple of hours and I'm not going to see you and I'm not going to talk with you and don't interrupt me. Um, but not only is she great as far as that stuff goes, she'll be like, oh, you know, I do need better audio cables because she was in the sound world before that she did audio for actually for a very large church down in um, Delaware. Oh. So it's been very helpful actually getting her perspective on things right now. She, we finished filming a music video as part of our support for the album and she's finishing up the editing on that music video knows enough about that world that I'm looking at her product and going this, well, it's at least on par with the rest of the music that we're making, which is, you know, it's not quite like I do this for my day job, but it is like, I'm at least a talented amateur. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That, so that support is so crucial when you have a relationship. Um, sure. Now, back long, long ago when I was married, I was playing music at a time <laughs> at a time when my marriage was on the rocks. Mm -hmm. So I went to the studio for two hours just to get away from her. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I don't have that same experience. Megan's pretty great. And I appreciate, like I said, a lot of the support 
uh, and just the fact that even creating this album. So when I went in and I started doing this in the studio, Mike, you're aware of this, Adrian, you're probably not, never having done this before. But one of the basic things you learn pretty quickly is what comes out of your amp, what comes out of your voice. That's not necessarily what the computer hears. Yes. So all of your equipment, your equipment is a barrier and it is legitimately trying to figure out what is the equipment that is going to enhance my presence in the studio mm -hmm. as opposed to detracting from it. And every microphone, for example, has a frequency response range. It has, you know, uh, like a curve or something to it where you're looking at it. And if you, if you mapped it out like a, a beta 58A, the closer you get to the microphone, the more bass and response you get to your vocals. So <laughs> some of the things that you take for granted, like the fact that I have a pretty good death metal scream, that's actually partly dependent upon my equipment. So when right. I went into the studio and I'm recording through condenser mics and these things that have um, much more of like a low end roll off, they're, they're much more focused on mid range. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going in there. I'm just like, I'm not hitting this. I'm not getting the same impact with my vocals. How do I do this? How do I bring this out? And the guy who I'm recording with, he's never recorded a metal album before. He has no idea. You know, he's reading up on it and he's trying to figure this stuff out. Mm -hmm. But you're trying to kind of muddle your way through this. And fortunately, through that entire process, me disappearing for, you know, a day or two at a time. Again, I had the support of Megan and I don't think I could have done it without that support, that understanding and um, that encouragement for that matter, because she's hearing the pieces right. and she's going, oh, you know, I really like the way that this sounds. And so in many ways, she's, you know, the big cheerleader keeping some of the stuff going. That's awesome. That, that's just awesome. Um, and talking about recording, mm. I got to ask, um, when you're live, Mike, I, I, I imagine at least part of your guitar sound was a microphone on the grill of the uh, of your cabinet. Yep. Um, did you have to dramatically roll back your gain to get that to come out right? Yeah, because mine is every time I'm like, and and I recently got an SM57 for its reputation for mic and cabinets. And, uh, you know, the intro piece, uh, Adrian, that I did for you, um, the guitar sound on there is is just way it, it's too oversaturated and i couldn't finagle it to to get it i mean it works for what we did for what i did for you um or at least from the feedback you gave me it works for <laughs> for what you wanted it for <laughs> um but uh I, but i wasn't satisfied with the particular i was satisfied with the the structure of the whole thing um, and how all the parts worked out and how it sounded, except for the quality of that distorted guitar sound. So what were the methods that you used to capture your guitar sound? So, um, well, a couple of things. First, one dramatic change I made. You may recall from years ago, I used to play through a Laney GH100L head. So probably the biggest change I made was I've switched from that to a Mesa Mark V. Um, because the Mark V just gives me a lot more options as far as the variety of tones that I can get from it. And it also has a lot more um, low end that I can bring into the mix. Mm -hmm. So it's got a lot of punch. It's got a lot of clarity. So some of the secret is just in the change of the amp head. Now I'm still playing through a Marshall cabinet and the two of them mesh fairly well together. I have no complaints about that. But as far as miking techniques, I actually use two microphones and this was um, not something that I knew to do. This was something that the guy who I was recording with did know to do. And what we used uh, up close was an SM57, but we also used a Royer ribbon mic to give a little bit more of the bass boost that you lose from the SM57. So we mixed the two. We had the one pointed straight, just a little bit offset from the center of one of the cones, the SM57, and then the Royer ribbon dropping down next to it. And he showed me a very interesting way using the, uh, the headsets to figure out, okay, where's the sweet spot where you're picking up just enough of the sound from each one. However, I will say that so much of the sound that we got was from layering guitars. So it was a lot less distortion than I would ever have anticipated, a mm -hmm. lot more layering than most people probably would guess. And then a metric buttload of EQing after the fact, where you're just going in and you're, you're listening and you're trying to create the space for the sound. That was also the big challenge with recording keyboards and yeah, trying to yeah. keep, especially JD is a very technical keyboardist. So 
trying to make sure that you can still hear all of the beautiful little parts that he has throughout the music. That was so hard. It was so hard to be able to get the vocals to still show up, the guitars to still have yep, some yep. level of presence and some meat to them, mm -hmm. and getting his keyboards to still have a place to shine through. So we ended up making his keyboards EQ'd super high. You know, they're they're all 3K, 5K plus. That's so much of the keyboard that we recorded for this album is in that pocket. Mm -hmm. And Adrian, yeah. what I'm speaking about here for um, those of us who don't play music or you know really aren't into this is just the frequency in which the human ear perceives sound. Uh, a lot of the mm -hmm. human voice, if I start going up and speaking more in you know, this register or projecting it up above this, you're starting to get up into maybe more of that 5K, 7K range, the, the sharper, higher elements of sound. Whereas the low end of the speaking voice and for that matter, like a bass guitar, that's all occurring below the 1K. In fact, for that matter, well below the 500 um, Hertz range. And so at that frequency, you're perceiving it uh, maybe when you get down to a certain point, you're perceiving it more as the feeling, like the bass hitting you mm -hmm. in the chest yep, more yep. than just what you're hearing in the ear. So you're, yeah, there was a lot of playing with these pockets, just trying to create this space. Okay, here's where the keyboard's gonna go. This is gonna be the guitar. It's gonna overlap it just slightly, but at the same time, now your vocals, because the, especially in a male voice, if you ever look at what a male voice looks like when you just record it, um, it's huge. Uh, we occupy like this massive sound spectrum. It's all over the place. How do you create space for all of those things? So, yeah, that was a little far afield from what you were asking, Mike. But yeah, that was some of the challenges that we dealt with. And hopefully it's- No, that, that, that was great. Great explanation. Um, because that those are, people don't realize the, um, the, the how much frequency overlaps of different instruments affect how they sound together. Yeah. So it's a lot harder to make two guitars playing in the same area of, of the fretboard. It's harder to get those sounds delineated or non-muddy yep. than it is if one's playing in a high register and one's playing in a low register um, or how much overlap there is of the standard center of a piano or keyboard with the frequency range of the guitar and the, the sounds so easily get lost. They go, they just become mush. Um, That's right. And, and you really have to figure out the ways to separate those sounds to, to make them distinct. So you can, especially in recording that you can hear them. I mean, things can always be a little muddier when you're live, but <laughs> You know, you want everything crystal clear on, on a recording. Yeah, that's so true. And uh, I should add, too, that none of this was stuff that I knew before I went in to do this. This was the first time that I was really this involved, and it was a tremendously informative process for me, but also horrible at the same time. Never, ever do what I did, which is have to learn literally everything. I mean, I went from the last, the demos that we did, we did them in basement studios and uh, somebody else handled all of that portion of things. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And really all I was doing was bringing my amp in and playing and, um, you know, doing vocals periodically. Whereas this, it was, okay, I'm playing through a Scarlet 2i4 interface. I'm recording it to Reaper. I have to figure out where my, all my sound peaks should be so that after the fact I'm not distorting. Um, it's figuring out how to layer things perfectly. It's dealing with things like interface lag, which I didn't know that was a thing, but my very first uh, interface was a Roland Duo Capture EX. And I'm trying to record layers of technical metal with a 100 millisecond lag. You can't do it. It was, I'm like, I don't know why it doesn't sound like I'm playing exactly at the same time. Well, it's because my interface has so much lag that literally yep. by the time I'm hearing the note, the time for me to have played it was already passed. Yeah, it's a 100 I mean, that was, millisecond doesn't sound like uh, that long of a time when you're when you're aligning up music. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a um, big deal. It, it's it, like, it'll in essence sound like an echo. Yes, exactly. It's cool. like the human ear really readily perceives anything that's more than 15 milliseconds. Um, and it's the equivalent actually of being 100 feet away from somebody who's speaking to you. So it's literally that same amount of delay every millisecond is about one foot of delay. So, so, 
So the software you used was Reaper? That's correct. So Reaper okay. ended up being my, my workstation for everything. And that's, I guess, another good pointer for anyone who's going into the studio who's trying to do the same thing. My technique throughout this was reamping. So part of the way that I was able to achieve, um, in many cases, a very clean, distorted sound that for the most part, I'm pretty happy with, especially on you know, really heavy songs like uh, Before the Tyrant Throne. Um, but the way that we did that was reamping. So I recorded everything through this workstation. I had everything done clean. And then we took it to the studio after the fact and passed it through the amplifier. And okay. first, the, 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 the big first advantage to this is you can play with the amp settings for as long as you want. Yep. And by comparison to just trying to do take after take, nail everything perfectly and adjust your amp tone every time until you finally get right. something you like, finally you get a take that sounds perfect to you. This was far faster, far easier than trying to right. do that. Well, that that's what I had heard that a lot of uh, a lot of you know the the top bands when they're recording, they'll I mean they might have four, six, or even eight mics on a cabinet, but they will always run a dry signal. So so you get that whole you get the whole amplifier and the cabinet effect, but you have a completely dry signal that you can do anything with that you need and you can even dump the whole thing if it sounds better by you know using the amp sims in in the software um which is something that i haven't i haven't worked with my conscience whispers project um the instrumental stuff that i did uh i did that all recording in my house and uh back then it was with cakewalk i used uh cakewalk home studio um, and that was, it was a long process, but it was a fun process. Once you got the feel for what you were doing and, and putting the parts together and, um, capturing the different sounds, um, it was, uh, it was quite an experience, but I didn't know any uh, of the stuff about the EQ ranges and things like that. I just tried to pan sounds to different areas of the stereo, stereo range so you would hear them like in headphones or something um, and hear the different parts. <coughs> uh, but I also, with that project, I used a lot of uh, orchestral instrument sounds um, from my keyboard and, uh, and combining those and uh, dealing with similar, uh, tonal ranges but different timbers so like I have a piece that, that has a section in it that is um, it's a uh, bassoon and oboe um, and uh, there were some other kind of odd uh, instrument sounds that I used and working with their different ranges and the different timbers and trying to work them so they um, matched up and didn't kind of cancel each other out sort of thing. Um, really, really interesting. And it's something that, that a lot of musicians never really get into if they don't get into a, a recording situation, you know, and people don't think how, I mean, the recording process in and of itself is an incredible creative process that you have these creative geniuses that may not even know how to play a single note, but they can make a recording sound phenomenal. Yeah, and unfortunately I'm not one of those people. Uh, so I had to have a lot of help from the guy who I was working with. And of course he on top of that is just doing a lot of reading on the side. He's you know going, well, I don't know how to get metal drums to sound exactly like they do. Let me read about this. So that the, I think what I enjoyed most about this process and working with this guy, Chuck, was that he really allowed me to experiment with that stuff. And he was as interested in the result as I was. Um, and at a certain point, you know, because up until COVID hit, I was over there pretty much every weekend for months at a stretch, just as we're trying to muddle our way through this, because of course, these are the, the massive barriers you're encountering. You're trying to produce your music 
and you're still trying to make it sound the same way it sounds like when you're in a live room. Yes. You know, you're trying to capture some of that. And again, like I said, the, the equipment is part of the barrier. The, the frequency ranges, these are part of the barriers. These are things that you're trying to get around. And fortunately, he was just fantastic as far as um, the whole process went. He would just, he would sit with me and we'd figure out, okay, what do we have to do to make this stuff shine through? And sure, I guess in some ways it would have been easier if I'd gone with a studio where somebody mm -hmm. really knew metal, but I would not have learned nearly as much. So, so, for, so, so go ahead. who was this guy? Uh, give him a shout out if you want. Okay, his name is uh, Chuck Jobski, and he has a small studio. He actually he used to run a, a really large studio down in Atlanta. He's since moved up to the Springfield, Pennsylvania area. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's got this small basement studio where he's got a couple of isolation rooms that he's set up. Uh, he has a full kind of command center, big old Neve audio console. He still has the, uh, the, the old analog equipment, which interestingly enough, we used. Um, uh -huh. So that's kind of your fun fact from behind the scenes. And um, it just tons and tons of stuff, big Pro Tools rigged and just Mac with like, I think it's I think it's 27 processors and even that's outdated by comparison to what they use at this point and it's a pretty serious <laughs> setup and he's really into it just all these microphones and just metal had never happened to be something that he had done before so yeah. he came in he was very excited about the project and he was he said he was great to work with that's awesome listening to you describe the uh the recording process itself it's nowhere near as easy as i thought it would be um it's, it seems uh, very complicated. Now, does that influence your writing prior to in any way or change your writing? Like, okay, I'm, I'm writing this, but I'm not <laughs> gonna get it in the studio. So, so um, that's an excellent question, Adrian, and I'm glad that you asked. It did not influence my writing at all prior to. It will absolutely influence my writing going yeah. forward. <laughs> <laughs> That, that was quite the experience. One of the big takeaways I've gotten from this is if I do this again in future, and my plan is to do so, if there are going to be keyboards, there will not be a second guitar. You can pretty much guarantee that because it was just too much work to try and make the keyboards and a second guitar show up at the same time. Destroyed Invincible, there is a whole second guitar in there. You just can't hear it. I recorded everything on second guitar, but you couldn't hear that and the keys at the same time. And actually, it's funny, Mike, because one of your comments stuck with me as we were EQing that to get the keys to uh, stand out. Um, you would come to a show at Mojo 13 back when it was Mojo 13, and you said uh, one of the things that had disappointed you about the sound that particular night was you couldn't hear the interplay between the guitars and the keyboard that had been so, uh, I guess, essential for that song. So that was something that actually stuck with me in the studio. There's my uh, shout out to you. I'm going into this, and the guy who I was working with, Chuck, He's very guitar driven. So he kept trying to really turn up that second guitar. He loved the interplay between the first and the second guitar when it was more guitar driven. And it was cool, but I finally had to say like, okay, let's just turn it down. You know, maybe we'll do a B-side at some point where we release this and it sees the light of day. People can hear, okay, there's the second guitar, but you do that, you won't hear the keyboard. That's just the Well, actually what, the what, might, be, what might be fun what to do with that B-side is, yeah. uh, is transcribe the keyboard part for a third guitar. Mm. So you have three guitars going. That would be kind of fun. It'd be <laughs> kind of fun to hear all that. Now, um, in talking about changing the way you write, one of the things that I found is that when I was doing the home recording, you know, none of those instrumentals that I did um, could I ever play live because it's just me in the studio i could make as many tracks as i wanted i have like five guitar parts in in i mean one of the songs i designed specifically to have single note lines on about four different guitars so the lines were harmonized and no one's playing chords you know and i'm like yeah, there's no way I could put a band together to do that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> unless I had like an orchestra of guitars or something, and then a, a several keyboards and things like that. But I found that um, creative process 
just a blast where you just can add, you know, as many layers as you want, as long as they work. If they don't work, do something else. Or if they don't work, yeah, that, that doesn't work in this piece. So let's leave it this way. You know, and it was just fun to have that kind of freedom where I could do that rather than having to think, okay, I have two guitars, a keyboard, a bass and drums, you know, because we have to replicate this live. <laughs> sure. And that is, I guess, some of the fun of the studio. Now, that being said, I do always keep in mind what it is that we're going to be able to pull off in a live environment and or at least what I would like to be able to pull off in a live environment, realistically speaking. Yeah. So the majority of, of what I'm writing, again, because I'm a guitarist, a stringed instrument player, it tends to be guitar driven. And it is with the idea we have two guitars and probably two guitars in this section. So whether or not that is the reality remains to be seen. I, I use this album as a way to start advertising for musicians again. And I've had a couple of applicants and hopefully it works out, but I've learned that I can't really count on that. Musicians as a people, they're unpredictable and uh, tend to be broke more times than not. Yeah. And they're flakes. They're flakes. <laughs> so what, it's, you've got almost no chance of finding somebody who is skilled enough to play our stuff, wants to play our stuff, isn't in a band already, doesn't already have their own musical ideas and their own drive and determination. When I first started doing the music promotion um, back in 06, um, when I first started uh, writing the uh, poetry and stuff, um, one of the bands that I was working with over in Jersey, uh, when I mentioned that I, I do write, they had asked about using one of my poems for uh, as a song. And I told them, it's like, well, it's not really written like that. It's, it's a poem. It's not a song. And his response was, isn't that basically what a song is? Um, now, I, I never really thought much to it um, until recently where I decided that because trying to figure out ways to get my stuff out there, you know, and um, I started the publishing company so I can actually have a, a publishing name behind it when I start uh, re-releasing my, my books that I've written, uh, whether it's the, the books of poetry or it's the short stories um, that I've done and uh, the stories that I'm, I'm currently working on. But um, one of the ideas I had was to, uh, okay, let's, let's put some music to it. Can I put music to these writings and turn them into songs? And it's a project that uh, uh, Mike and I are, are working on. Um, and it was actually going over to the one song uh, or the one writing with him was, was kind of neat because as he's like, I, I know nothing about music you know i i know what i hear i know what i like but as far as like i i'm obviously not a musician um and i've never you know really done anything with with it like that other than putting on a show but mike explained to me like the the layout of a song like how you have the chorus the bridge and all this stuff and it was actually pretty much this particular one was already written he's like this is a song we can you know, minor changes to it and then add music, you know. Um, what, what I'm trying to get at as I ramble on and on, do you write outside of music? Have you written anything other than lyrics? Have you written other, anything other than guitar? Um, maybe very small or very short bits of things. I enjoy reading a tremendous amount. So there's always the part of me that's like, okay, maybe I could explore this and um, it would be kind of fun to write a book or something along those lines. But for the most part, music is the only thing where I've pursued it with enough dedication to make anything happen. Um, Mike, would you like to add anything? I'm pretty much... Uh... I, th I think I've covered everything that I, that I had planned. Any, any questions that I had? Um, no, I think I got uh, pretty much all my questions in. Um, and uh, Josh really thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. Likewise. Um, you know, and I guess maybe it's mu musicians love talking music. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it also to have to talk creativity 
with other creators, not just musicians, you know, with, with Adrian coming from a writing perspective, you know, it's, it's really fun to get that cross creativity uh, input with how somebody else sees things. So really enjoyable. Likewise, I very much enjoyed the conversation. Actually, if I could add one thing, because I, I sort of had this on my mind, um, but didn't really delve into it. The last piece that I think goes into as far as like the lyric writing goes, to me that's very important, is actually the sound of the words. So oftentimes when I'm picking the lyrics for a song, it's influenced very much by what does it sound like? And I don't know if you're familiar with Lewis Carroll's The Jabberwocky, but that's a great example of a poem where it's entirely based upon the sounds of the words and it's viewed as a nonsense poem. I mean, it, it is nonsense. Yeah. It's mostly words that have, uh, you know, no meaning or didn't have a meaning prior to when he wrote it. You know, twas brilly again, the slithy toves did gyre and gibble in the wave, all mimsy were the bora groves and the malm wraths outgrabe. I mean, it's, it's just, a series of syllables that conveys still a mental image. And that is a lot of what I'm trying to do lyrically. So I'm trying to use these words, which first capture multiple concepts, because typically speaking, I've got, you know, a four minute piece of music where I have to convey to the listener an entire concept if they want to explore that. And that's up to them, you know, whether or not they actually want to dig into what it is that I'm talking about. Um, so I'm trying to find words that fit, but they also have to sound right. So it's finding the, the beauty or the harshness in the English language that is capable of conveying as much as the rest of the music. So from start to finish, in my opinion, a good piece of music should be an art form, should be right down to the sound of the lyrics. So that was the so last I, thing that I had on my list to cover. And you know what, that's a, that's a great point, Josh. Um, and, uh, to put it in a perspective that other people, not a genre of music that that a lot of people like, but that people would understand that exact idea of the sound of words is opera. That is written specifically for um, the certain vowels in certain places to create a sound. Um, yeah. So it's music, it's not just, to, uh, to me there's a difference between vocals and, mu and uh, music by a vocalist. So uh, some, some vocalists make incredible music with their voice um, and some do a good job conveying. You're exploring you know, the sound of words. So I know with, uh, with my dark poetry projects, which is kind of sort of part of the Conscience Whispers uh, instrumental project that I was doing, um, but not, I didn't write the poems to go with the music. I wrote them as a companion piece, as a different genre to give feeling that was being conveyed by the concept and by the music. Um, and uh, I remember in taking two years of creative writing in college uh, with my professor, luckily was a, a published poet. And poetry is about sound and imagery. That's right. And, and poetry had almost forgotten about that for a century when it became all focused on the written word um, until because poetry originally you know if you go back to ancient civilizations you know in ancient Greece the lyre player was not a musician he was the recounter of history that was by poetry um, and there may have been a thing that it was, it may have been easier to, me to memorize all of these. I think it's easier to, to memorize lyrics to a song because of the song than it is to just memorize words on a page. Um, and and so, so that that's sound aspect is so important uh, of sound of words. 
So I'm glad you brought that up. Agreed. And I think that's probably something that maybe resonates with Adrian a little bit too, uh, especially with you writing a little bit more as far as poetry goes, Adrian. I, I still don't really consider what I write poetry, but um, yeah, it's just get, getting it out, you know. Um, but this is uh, a very, very good conversation. And uh, it's actually a conversation I'd like to pick up again at a later point. You know, sure. Um, sure. I, I know we've had uh, um, discussions before where it was just, you know, bullshitting over a beer. You know, and it, it's always good to be able to, to talk to somebody who you can have that uh, discussion with going back and forth, you know. So even, you know, um, doing something like this again, you know, picking up uh, maybe like an, another topic or something, um, or just sitting there and having a beer or some Irish cream. Yeah, we, we, know have our milk. We, we know that's whole milk. <laughs> um, so well, Adrian, right. thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to be on this call with you, gentlemen. I really enjoyed it, and uh, it's great to see both of you again. We definitely can't let another ten years go by. I, I don't know yeah, where the time no. has gone. <laughs> dead. Um, Hell, another most... ten years, I might be dead. <laughs> That's true. The way you live, uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Once the uh, this whole COVID thing is done, we'll definitely have to get together in person and uh, have, that, absolutely. have that beer and stuff. Um, but again, great. Uh, thank you, uh, Josh, and thank you, Mike, for uh, co-hosting this with me. And um, until next time. Pleasure, guys. Have a great you night. You got it. Thank you. Voices. 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 Voices.